This well-known figure, this being that was once a meme sensation, is the Sakabamba fish species. Originally displayed at Finland's Helsinki Museum, this repaired model is where the meme got its start. The internet went crazy for its mysterious and one-of-a-kind expression, which became ubiquitous in GFs, music models, games, and emojis. The Sakabamba species, which became famous despite being a relatively insignificant prehistoric animal. Disappointingly though, despite its notoriety, very little is known about it and what little is out there is often inaccurate. When were they found, why are they shaped like that, and why were they rebuilt without fins? An educational and scientific exploration of the Sakabamba species is in the works for today on Cosmic Y. The Sakabamba species, which was once all over memes, is finally getting its scientific backstory. This type of fossil was investigated in 1986 in the Paleozoic Ordovician layers near the Sakabamba hamlet in Bolivia, east of the Andes Mountains. The researchers, Pierre-Yves Gagné, Alain Blique, and Gabriela Rodrigo identified the artifact as the Sakavamba species of prehistoric fish, which is its petrified armor. Gambieria is an etymology of the name of the person who found it Gagné, who was a pupil of the Paleozoic ichthyologist Philip Gambier. Sakabamba spis means the shield of Sakabamba, and the former is an origin of the latter. Listen up, folks. The fossil itself is so little that I am unsure if it represents a fish or not. Their discovery that the Sakabamba species resembles an oil can begs the question how you have my straightforward answer. Just because they discovered more comprehensive fossils, a number of fossils that bore the same shape as the first Sakabamba species were identified in another outcrop that belonged to the same stratum. Paleontologists were extremely fortunate when they discovered fossils belonging to as many as 30 different individuals. But how did their complete fossilization come to pass? Dr. Ghani responds with a fascinating theory. Rivers from Bolivia flowed into the Iapetus Ocean when the country was still a continent in the Ordovician epoch of the Paleozoic era. One day, when the river overflowed its banks, a flood of fresh water suddenly entered the ocean killing off many Sacabamba species and burying them under the sediment that the flood had carried downstream. We can observe the Sacabamba species in its entirety because of this catastrophe that happened hundreds of millions of years ago. Its look is interesting, but the tale of its discovery is tragic and intriguing in equal measure. Whatever the case may be, we will now start dissecting this creature piece by piece. The head is the first part to examine. As its name implies, the Sakabamba species' head is encased in armor that resembles a shield. Covering it from above and below are the enormous decks while the gills are covered by multiple small decks on the sides. Its armor served as a crucial line of protection, keeping it safe from predators like the two species of sea scorpions that lived during that era. The face is definitely the most striking feature of the head. One of its many endearing features is its jaw, which is distinctive from the typical fish and has an amusingly kooky appearance. The jaw emerged from the metamorphosis of the pharyngeal arch, a type of cartilage that had previously composed the gills as some of you may have observed in my earlier movie devoted to the subject of jaw evolution. The mouth was originally only a spherical hole before this transformation took place. Indeed, that form is readily apparent in more primitive fish species such as hagfish and lampreys. These kinds of fish are collectively known as jawless fish. This group of fish also included the jawless Sakabamba. Obviously, they lacked teeth unlike modern eels and knife fish. Nevertheless, the underside was concealed by tiny bony plates that stuck out from its mouth. This Sakabamba species likely subsisted on a diet of plankton and other organic waste that floated in the water which it sucked in and swallowed whole. Is it time to examine the corpse? Every part of the body is special in its own way. None of the three fin types, dorsal, pelvic, and pectoral, are present. A single fin adorns their back. The real reason this isn't an error in historical accuracy is that pectoral and dorsal fin evolution in fish happened after the Ordovician period, not before. 
jawless fish with pectoral or dorsal fins like Tugiaspis and Atalaspis first emerged in the Silurian epoch which followed the Ordovician, then jawed fish called placoderms appeared. These fish have a variety of fins including pelvic and dorsal fins, and they still rule the oceans today. At the same time, there is a fin-related incident involving the Sacabamba species. There has been some debate about the health of its sole fin, the tail fin, and the fin itself has been a point of contention. Even though the Sacabamba species fossil was in good condition, the shape of the tail fin could only be seen in two specimens, and even those had somewhat fuzzy ends. This is why the fin became a point of contention. Here, Dr. Gagné, who examined the fossils, preserved the Sacabamba species' tail by modeling it after the morphology of one of the two specimens whose tails were in good condition. But when scientists like Mark Wilson offered counter-arguments to the earlier results, Ghani took their criticisms in stride and chose to keep the Sacabamba species in a tadpole tail shape for preservation. The discussion about their tail form appeared to be reaching a close in 2005. However, a publication released in 2006 by Gagné and Janvier prompted another re-evaluation of the morphology of their tails. There was a problem with the specimen that showed the tail fin the best another Sacamba species head was blocking its view. The researchers were able to get a better look at the tail by gently cracking the head that covered it. This led to the representation of fins above and below as being of varied proportions once it was discovered that their tails had a tiny fin at the tip. Everything about it from its discovery to its portrayal has been fraught with difficulty. In addition, the Sacabamba species likely evoked thoughts of another animal in the minds of individuals who enjoy strange creatures. It is the Dunkleosteus, you are correct. They seem somewhat different, yet they both wear strong armor on their heads. Nonetheless, the two are distinct from one another. One important thing to know is that the Sacabamba species is actually a PAMP, the armored fish Dunkleosteus. Many different kinds of fish with scales or armor covering their bones emerged as fish first started to develop bones. One of these was the Sacabamba species. Among the jawless fish, there are a group of creatures called placoderms that evolved bony jaws at a later stage. Since each kind of placoderm is actually related to a separate lineage, the word is no longer widely used. However, it was originally used to classify the species that were intermediate between eel-like fish and placoderms for the sake of convenience. Dunkleosteus, on the other hand, is a placoderm which means it is one of the first jawed vertebrates. It's on a whole other level than placoderms, the fish without jaws. Put another way, if the early vertebrate evolution were to be graphically represented the Sacabamba species and Dunkleosteus would occupy almost the same locations, every placoderm shares this trait. While Dunkleosteus has jaws that can crush flesh, Sacabambaspis has the distinction of being the first vertebrate armored fish with skull bones. Species of Sacabamba are among the oldest types of fish known from complete fossils. These animals are more like Paleozoic era riches than the comedic depictions of them. Listen up, folks. In this case, a question will emerge. No, as vertebrates are supposed to have the spine as their first bone. However, if the coelacanth's first bone is the one that surrounds its head, one would question if it actually has a spinal column. I believe that's true. The fish without jaws lack vertebrae, notochord cartilage, and bone are the three main types of materials used by vertebrates to build their skeletons. The lamprey is an example of an early vertebrate with a cartilage and notochord spine, but no actual vertebrae. It was the same species of armored fish, Sacabamba. True vertebrae did not emerge until millions of years later when the shape of the spine was modified to incorporate bones that contained calcium phosphate. Plus, there's this fascinating fact our vertebrae and the armor of the Sacabamba species are essentially different kinds of bone despite their superficial similarities. Vertebrae are a type of endochondral bone, while armor is a type of membranous bone, the two main categories of bones distinguished by their development processes. 
Unlike endochondral bone, which is generated by a more involved process, including the replacement of cartilage with bone by osteoblasts, membranous bone is formed by a straightforward method in which osteoblasts directly construct the bone. The dermal bones evolved earliest in vertebrates, as was the case with earlier placoderms. Skeletal structures in the head area were the first to manifest. Thus, the majority of vertebrates' endochondral bones make up the trunk, whereas the majority of their membranous bones make up the skull. Depending on their place in the evolutionary tree, even identical bones might have rather distinct development processes. Isn't that amazing? Even more intriguing is the fact that we can determine where teeth first appeared by analyzing the skeletons of the Sakalava people. In a cross-section of a Sakabamba shell, you can make out unique materials that aren't found in regular bones. Dentin and enameloid forms it. Denser and harder than typical bone, these substances project from the carapace to form projections known as odontodes. Our teeth originated from these creatures, albeit the term odontode may be foreign to you. Would you like to see how a human tooth is made? Enamel sits over dentin, the structural component of teeth. Upon closer inspection, one can observe structural similarities with placoderm and odontodes. Sure, our teeth didn't originate from the odontodes of prehistoric fish. Fish teeth and scales originated from odontodes that were encased with enameloid. Enamel developed in bony fish and was later adopted by terrestrial vertebrates. Once terrestrial vertebrates lost all enameloid properties in their teeth and could only layer dentin with enamel, shark scales are considered to be one of the best examples of a vertebrate toothless structure since they retain the appearance of a primitive odontode and are structurally extremely similar to shark teeth. This is how modern chondrichthyan fish evolved from more primitive ancestors with more complex features like jaws and fins as well as new kinds of bones. Also, nature didn't just leave it alone during the Devonian, it gave rise to bony fish with cartilaginous structures and bony fish that turned all of their bones into cartilage except for teeth and scales. In your opinion, how interesting is the evolutionary tale that started with the adorable Sacabambaspis fish? The most exciting thing about paleontology, in my opinion, is that even a tiny, inconsequential fossil like a fishbone can have a fantastic story, almost like a play. The story of Sacabambaspis proves that even the strangest looking fossil can hold the key to understanding our evolutionary past. Beneath the viral meme lies a creature that shaped the future of life on Earth quietly, mysteriously, and powerfully. So, the next time you see that goofy little face, remember, it's not just a meme. It's a legacy written in bone. If you enjoyed uncovering the truth behind this prehistoric oddity, make sure to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to Cosmic Why. For more deep dives into the hidden stories of science history and the cosmos, hit the bell so you don't miss the next mystery waiting to be unearthed. Thanks for watching, and remember, every fossil has a story.